Okay, good morning. It's just about still. Good morning, or Borada, as we say in Wales, where I'm from. Uh, my, name, my name is Wendy Sadler. I sit on the advisory board of Science Squared. Science Squared is a project uh, funded by the ERC with the aim of trying to engage a wider public with the excellent research that is funded by the ERC. So it's an honor to be able to come and help at this event and to chair this session. Obviously, this is a policy-based event, but we thought it would be great to actually hear from some of the researchers themselves about some of the work they're doing in an area that is of interest to everyone. When we talk, I, I'm involved in running a social enterprise called Science Made Simple, and it's our mission to try and engage the next generation of researchers and engineers. And it's because of that, I think it's vitally important that we use topics that the public care about and that researchers get better at communicating what they do to a public audience. So Science Squared, I would urge you to have a look at the website if you haven't, sciencesquared.eu, is trying to highlight these areas of big public interest by focusing on ERC research. And at the moment, that topic, if you look at the website, is about food, which is what we're going to look at today. Now, when I'm training young researchers, we often say food is one of those great levelers. Almost everyone has an opinion or a passion or an interest, at least, in food. We do need it. So those sort of one of the three things that are always a great hook for the wider public. So it's great that we're going to be talking about three very different aspects to that today. Um, the format of the session is we're going to hear from three researchers for only seven minutes. I've been quite strict. I know that's a very difficult challenge. Um, and we're going to hear a sort of overview of their research and how it matters to the wider public. And then after we've, all the speakers have, have presented, we'll have a panel session where we will talk a little bit about the idea of basic research and public engagement with research, perhaps, and the duties of scientists to kind of work on problems that the public see as important. So who should decide the direction of research? And we'll have a little conversation about that with questions from the audience, too. So I've got three speakers. I'm not going to stand up and introduce each one between the talks because we're quite short of time and I want us to have time for the discussion. Uh, we've got Professor Anna Davis is going to speak first and then Dr. Raikelt Hootkapoor and then Professor Miguel Gonzalez who's going to speak last. They will introduce themselves and give you an overview of their research. At the end of the three presentations, we'll come back and have a discussion about the overarching themes. So Anna, if you'd like to go first, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's lovely to be here. Um, as Wendy said, food is kind of a great leveller. It's also very important to how we live and how we will live in the future. October the 16th, this, this Sunday coming, is UN World Food Day. And the tagline for this year's activities is the climate is changing, food and agriculture must change too. So one of the world's biggest challenges is how to create sustainable food futures. So Share City, which is my project, is addressing this challenge by examining the practice and sustainability potential of ICT-enabled food sharing enterprises in cities. Well, why cities? Well, 50% of the world's population live in cities currently, and this is expected to rise to 80% by 2050. Cities also consume 75% of natural resources and produce more than a billion tonnes of waste, half of which is organic and mostly food waste, every year. Now, food production has increased globally significantly over the last 50 years, but still one in eight people go hungry. So we need innovation if we're going to meet the sustainable development goals around zero hunger, <coughs> health, nutrition, sustainable cities and communities. But why sharing? Well, sharing is a familiar practice. The skills, rules, tools and norms about what should be shared and how are well known in our particular cultures. And ICT is stretching the spaces and scales over which sharing can take place. 
encouraging what might be called sharing amongst strangers. And there are claims being made here that it creates economic vitality, social capacity, and reduces environmental impact. But there's little data reporting this, actually examining what it does. So ShareCity will address this knowledge gap. It's a five-year phased project which is transdisciplinary in focus. That means multi-disciplines and working with stakeholders from public, private, and civil society. Initially, we are in the first phase, in the first year, we're mapping across iFood sharing activities across 100 cities. We found more than 4,000 enterprises to date. The next phase will be looking in depth at contrasting context in 10 cities around the world. The second, third, and fourth phases relate to the co-design of sustainability impact assessment toolkits and building future scenarios about how we might wish to plan for a more sustainable urban future. Now, the database here, you can see is a screenshot, is available online, at least partially, the full research database. Is probably not of interest to the general public or to the sharing enterprises themselves. But what we have done is create a global map. And what's clear here is that ICT-enabled food sharing is occurring across the globe, concentrated perhaps in global north and Europe, unsurprising given the differentials in internet penetration in these places, but it's a global phenomenon. So I can't go into the details of what we found in this first phase, but what is interesting to note, it is that this iFood sharing is multifaceted in its character. It's diverse. Lots of things are shared, the food stuff of sharing, but also skills and knowledge is shared, spaces are shared, whether that's growing spaces in community gardens or co-working, cooking spaces and shared kitchens. What's interesting to note here is that knowledge and skills come out at top, but in most organisations, what we've found is that they share multiple dimensions. So you might share meals with knowledge and skills or fruits and vegetables with land. What we found is that nearly two thirds of the enterprises are involved in gifting food. So redistributing that food for free between donors and recipients. But 42% of them involve exchange for money, for profit or not for profit. In terms of the ICT enablement, you can see here from these infographics that the predominant ICT mediation is through the website. But Facebook and Twitter are increasingly important ways in which sharing organisations can communicate with others. We see the smallest number is apps. And these are very specialised things which have emerged in recent years, which enable the redistribution of food or the redistribution of knowledge about food between donors and recipients. What we're particularly interested in for the further phases of the research is looking at the sustainability claims which are made from these organisations. So here you can see some of the statistics. What we found was that 78% of the enterprises claim some economic benefits, either through generating income through new means or by saving money by availing of homegrown crops or food which is of a cheaper uh, nature. Similarly, 76% identified social benefits and around 61% environmental benefits. But these are claims only. What we are seeking to do is examine exactly what impact they are having. And this will come in the later phases of research. But I'd encourage you to play around with our database. As I said it's available from our website, which is literally sharecity.ie. You can search by cities, you can search by what is shared, and you can search by how it is shared. And what that will do when you filter through our database will bring up a list of organisations which you can click right through to immediately. So what this is doing, really, is creating the first systematic analysis of this emergent sector, providing a, a landscape view, admittedly a snapshot, because it's a very dynamic area as well, so these organisations are popping up all the time. And what we're seeking to do through networks and communication is to encourage enterprises and people who know about these enterprises to feed them back to us so that we can constantly update the public-facing database throughout the five years of the project. So it's the first systematic analysis that's being conducted. 
We're going to be working with sharers, with the regulators of sharers, and with uh, organisations who are interested in the ramifications of iFood sharing. Providing comparable data, so providing a bedrock really for this sector, and hopefully a platform and a hub where we can explore other areas of sharing in economies in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is it working? Yes, it's working. So my name is Rikold Houtkoper, and uh, I'm a scientist in Amsterdam in the Laboratory of Genetic Metabolic Diseases. And the research that we are focusing on within the context of my ERC grant is actually trying to uh, connect food research or nutritional research to aging. So the effect of foods on, on, in the long term on longevity. And um, I will tell you in the next couple of minutes a little bit of what, where we are coming from, the type of work that we did and also where we should be headed, at least in my opinion, en route to 2030. Um, and I, I don't think I have to explain for this audience that aging is a societal challenge that we're all facing. So the aging population is growing quite rapidly. Uh, the population of 60 years and older uh, is getting 30% or more in many Western countries, uh, but actually across the world, uh, this is growing also very rapidly. And this is not only uh, coming along with uh, socio-economical uh, issues such as pension age and, and similar problems, um, but at the same time also it affects uh, different organ systems, uh, so the medical issues that are, uh, come with this, uh, the brain, uh, the heart, the fat, and, and the muscle. And in each of these tissues, and I'm not even mentioning cancer, which is also age-related, uh, there's different diseases associated with that. Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease in, in the brain and many others in, in other tissues. Um, and we've come to realize over the last couple of decades that there's uh, two important factors that, that uh, contribute to the aging process. Uh, one is uh, genes, uh, which can either accelerate aging or slow down aging. And the other part is nutrition, which can do the same. Some nutritional components can accelerate your aging and some can slow down aging. Uh, and so it's not a passive process. It's, it's not something that just happens and in the end you die. It's something that is actually can be done something about it. Um, and in research, there's, there's uh, many uh, models that you can use. Obviously, we would like to, uh, to go to humans. That's ultimately what we would like to do, to get healthy aging in humans. But there's many other basic, simple model <coughs> organisms that we use for our research. So this can be flies, it can be monkeys, dogs. Uh, the naked mole rat voted the second ugliest animal uh, on the planet a couple of years ago. Uh, on the top right, you can imagine why. Um, and our favorite model is actually the worm, uh, the bottom uh, uh, middle. And um, a typical example of, of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years is highlighted here. So this is a worm, an elderly worm, 19 days. And in worm life, that would be equivalent to like 80 years in a human life. And this worm is basically over the course of two minutes that you see here, uh, wiggling its head a little bit. The head, head side is over here. It's just wiggling the head and not moving around. But then if we silence one of the genes in the worms, we can very easily do this in the lab, um, it's actually very actively moving around. And this is not just moving around, it's not escaping from, from the plate, it's very happy. Um, and it lives, um, it lives about 60% longer than the other one. So this worm would reach in human life uh, 120. Um, okay trying to get to the next, yes. And uh, I won't bore you with all the details, but we've come to the conclusion that this is, has to do with metabolism. And so what is metabolism? Metabolism basically is like this, this subway map um, where uh, the, the different foods that you eat, either carbohydrates, fats, or proteins, need to be broken down into some sort of energy to keep your muscles moving, to keep your brain active, etc. But you can imagine that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of individual variation between everyone here in the audience as well. Um, and this variation is either, for instance, uh, making uh, the track going from carbohydrates to energy. Some people may have this track, some people may have this bypass route. Um, and this is just in your genes. At the same time, what also contributes is the number of trains you put on each track. I mean, if you have many trains on this track, your carbohydrates will go perfectly fine, whereas others maybe are a bit more problematic. And actually, you can see this, uh, everyone, I go to the next, yes. Everyone knows these kind of stories in your, in your environment, so friends and family. Uh, there's always some people that, that can eat whatever they like, 
uh, with, while staying skinny and healthy, um, whereas others, uh, like myself, I have to admit, um, even when eating only a salad, already gain a couple of pounds, um, <laughs> and uh, in the long term have the, the disadvantageous uh, effects of these diets. Um, and so this is what we try to understand, but we don't do this in humans. We like to do this in a population study. And again, as I said, we love to work with these worms. And um, what we did a couple of years ago, actually it was collaborators of ours who did, who did this, uh, they mated uh, a Hawaiian worm, and this is really a Hawaiian worm, uh, with a Bristol worm. Uh, and so all the babies, or actually the grandchildren, will be a mixture, like in our, our situation, there will be a mixture of genes between the Hawaiian worm and the Bristol worm. And so we essentially have a population now like our own population, and we can start feeding, we can start, is it working? Yes. Yeah. We can start feeding all these individual worms that are genetically diverse with different diets. And which way should I point? Yes. Um, <laughs> And this is a worm eating. Actually, you can see here the throat. You can see the, the food coming in. Um, so we're actually feeding all these different worms with the different diets. We can do this in relatively high throughput. If you, if you do this in humans, it would take decades or centuries. Uh, for a worm, it just takes a couple of weeks. Um, and so, again, which way should I point? Yes, oops. Um, what we essentially try to achieve is healthy aging in humans. Um, so we, we don't necessarily want to prolong life to 150 or 120, but we would like to ensure that everyone lives to 85 in, in a healthy situation. Um, but to get there, um, there's still a long road uh, to go. Uh, we need this basic research. We cannot just rely on research in humans. We need these different models, including the worm, including flies, and it's going to be a winding road. It's not going to be a straight line uh, to the goal. There will be some roadblocks, and I think it's very important to invest in this kind of basic research, like ERC did in my research and, and my research team, uh, to make us get to this, uh, this end goal. Thank you. Congratulations. So good morning. It is a pleasure for me to present here some results and some methods of our investigation. I come from the University of Navarra in Spain, and uh, I, uh, I am the PI of an advanced research grant for, funded by the ERC on the Mediterranean diet. So uh, here, what is going? Okay. So this is the, the, the bad news. Every year, 36 million people die because of non-communicable disease. The problem for public health is not a flu pandemic, it's not a new virus. The problem for public health is non-communicable diseases. So three out of every five deaths in the world are due to these NCDs, non-communicable diseases. So this is not working. Okay. So we can count one, two, three, who is going to receive hmm, the chances? Is this like a Russian, Russian roulette? What is this? Hmm? So it is not a Russian roulette. It is highly preventable because ma many of these, of these deaths are occurring before 60 years, 9 million a year, and they could be preventable. So here we have the projections. Nowadays, we have every year 80 million deaths because of cardiovascular disease, almost 9 million deaths every year from cancer. And the projections are, for example, for cardiovascular disease, about 24 million for 10, 2030. So um, this is a huge problem that we need to address with uh, research and, uh, and in innovation. And we know the determinants. That is the, the, the great humiliation for public health. We perfectly know, because of a large, enormous accrual of epidemiologic evidence, what are the factors that are leading to these diseases. And in first place, you have here dietary risk. They are involved, these are the, the leading causes of death, and here dietary risks are involved in many of these conditions, in many of these causes. So our challenge is to modify these dietary habits. 
All this information comes from observational studies, just to observe what people eat and eventually, in the long run, what they are experiencing. But the challenge is, can we modify the dietary habits of the population? So, so the scientific report of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans released last year said that we have three uh, dietary patterns, and among them, the consistency in findings from epidemiologic studies was remarkable for the Mediterranean diet. In fact, what is the Mediterranean diet? The Mediterranean diet gives, uh, this is the most frequently used score that goes from zero to nine points, gives one point if the consumption is, is high of the ratio of monounsaturated to saturated fat, fruits and nuts, vegetables, cereals, legumes, and fish, and a low consumption of meat, especially red and processed meats, and whole dairy, and then a moderate consumption of alcohol, mainly in the form of red wine with meals. So, and this is a meta-analysis that we published two years ago. These are large studies with more than 10,000 people each showing the benefit for each two points higher adherence to the Mediterranean diet in this zero to nine score. You see, this is the reduction in the risk. 10% reduction in the risk of cardiovascular disease by following the Mediterranean diet, a closer adherence. But this is observational again. What do we know about intervention? We did the largest uh, randomized trial of nutrition all over Europe in Spain. We published it in the New England Journal of Medicine three years ago. So we selected 7,447 participants at high risk of cardiovascular disease because either they were type two diabetics or they have three or more major cardiovascular risk factors, and we randomized them to three groups. In two groups, in these two groups, we educated them in following the Mediterranean diet. And we provided in the first group for free uh, an allotment of 15 liters of extra virgin olive oil every three months. In the second group, we gave them Instead of the virgin olive oil, we recommended them to, to consume a lot of olive oil, but instead of providing for free the olive oil, we provided them for free three nuts to consume 30 grams per day, almonds, hazelnuts, and walnuts. And in the third group, we gave them the recommendations by the American Heart Association at that time that was a low-fat diet to reduce all type of fats. This is olive oil is 100% fat, Nuts are very rich in fat. Here, we forbid the fat. Hmm? That was the state of the art at that time. So this is the largest trial ever conducted all over Europe with nutrition. And what were the results? This is the new cases of myocardial infarction. We were counting year after year, year the number of participants who develop a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, uh, a stroke, or cardiovascular death. These are the two groups rich in fat. This is the low fat diet. We observe a 30% reduction in the risk of the principal causes of death in the world. So this is a hallmark study conducted with the Mediterranean diet. But we have published more than 200 papers with this study. You can find them in predimed.es because we have found also for other cardiovascular diseases, as peripheral artery disease, amputation of legs, also for atrial fibrillation, for diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, a strong reduction in the risk of breast cancer with the Mediterranean diet, and also benefits for cognitive function, some of them to appear. But we did nothing regarding other things. We, we didn't say a very good advice in nutrition. There is eat less of everything if you want to avoid obesity. Hmm? This is a good ab advice. <laughs> we never gave that advice to our participants to cut calories. We never gave them the advice of doing more physical activity. Do you think is it good? All the doctors recommend increase your physical activity. Do we have any trial showing that increasing physical activity reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease? No, we don't. Hmm? And, and we didn't say anything about goals for weight loss. So now we are doing, with the help, the funding of the ERC, this new trial. We are adding to the Mediterranean diet three new elements, 
energy restriction, physical activity, and behavioral intervention. We went this step up from the low fat diet to the Mediterranean diet with the first trial. Now our control group received the Mediterranean diet and we are going one step up, adding to the Mediterranean diet the full package to prevent cardiovascular disease. So this is the design. We have recruited, the recruitment has ended this month, 6,000 new participants, and we have randomized them to two groups, one with the full package, another one with the usual care that is now the Mediterranean diet. And we provide to both of them both olive oil and tree nuts for free. Hmm? <laughs> so, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and this is the 17 item screener that you can find here with the explanation. All things in green is to increase, to be increased, and all things in pink is to be reduced. So I don't have enough time, but you can find in taste tests, you can find everything explained. So these are the changes in the first participants after six months and one year. We have observed an increase in the adherence to this 17 screener, 17, uh, 17 item screener of energy restricted, this means energy restricted Mediterranean diet at six months versus control and also at one year. And also weight change without any medication for weight change, we have observed 5% weight change, significantly higher than control in the first participant, and also fitness. The chair fitness test is to count how many times are you able to stand up and sit down in 30 seconds from a chair. Hmm? So it is a very easy test in the medical practices. So we have found also a benefit here. So in summary, the real threat is non-communicable disease, freely chosen lifestyle strongly determine these major causes of death in our world. The most important advice in nutrition is watch your weight, and this is what we are doing now. No other dietary pattern in the world has such a strong evidence to support its benefit. And an energy-restricted Mediterranean diet is probably the most sensible option to combat obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease that are the huge 21st century epidemics. So I want to thank all the collaborators. We, these are the, the 11 centers working in PREDIMED 1, and now we have 23 centers because we, we have included also all these 12 new centers. Thank you very much. Great. Three fascinating topics. I've learnt uh, a lot even in those seven minutes. I particularly like the one to two red glasses of wine a day <laughs> and take away, as well as eat less. Um, so we're hopefully just about, we've got ten, five, ten minutes, yeah? I have a little bit of time to discuss with the panel some of the issues and take some questions from the audience if there are. I think everyone was very interested in the wide range of work being done there. Can I ask you all just for your brief opinion on... Who do you think should make the decision of who funds this kind of research? So we're calling your sort of search basic research as in not directly connected perhaps to an economical benefit, although obviously there are, um, or an innovation. Who, who should make that decision? The public, the scientists, the politicians? Anna, do you want to start or? That's a tricky one. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's, uh, I think it benefits everyone ultimately. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think there's shared responsibility to invest um, the difficulty is the benefits are not necessarily immediate, but that is also the strength of the ERC scheme, is that it allows blue skies thinking to address um, and approach issues in new ways, novel ways, without being guaranteed of success. Lots of other funding streams almost require you to know what you'll find before you do the research, whereas we're allowed to experiment, and that's what we need with these meta-societal challenges. Yeah. Okay. How about the others? I, I, I fully agree with, with that. I, I think scientists, for, for a large part, should decide which direction to go. I think it's sometimes difficult to predict uh, which direction uh, will be successful. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some new initiatives also for, in the Netherlands, for instance, with the research agenda, which basically allowed all the, the general pu public to pose questions that researchers uh, should solve. Fortunately, there was some sort of filter at the, at the researcher level to group all this, these questions into clusters, into themes that, that are attractive for the public to, 
to investigate, and I think there is some, uh, some benefit in that uh, to, to make sure that at least part of the research uh, connects to what the public wants, but I think there should still be a large portion of the budget that is fully open um, and gives you the freedom to explore uncharted territory. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree that the, the scientists should have the, the major part in the decision mm -hmm. because the, the, a grant, the proposal for a grant need to be soundly based in good science and also the scientists are in a better position to judge the feasibility mm -hmm. of the study that you are intending to do. And for example, uh, what about the other stakeholders? I mean the food industry in our field. Well, if I send this proposal to the producers of olive oil or nuts, they will mm -hmm. go to yeah. give me funding. Yeah. I did not, hmm? yeah. because I don't want to create a conflict of interest. I want to be completely free of the food industry when I say something. And this is even better for, for the food industry, mm. because this guy is independent of us and is saying that olive oil or tree nuts are reducing heart disease. So it is better yeah. to keep apart those who have a conflict of interest. Yeah. with the result of the research. And I think that's one of the reasons a lot of the surveys show the public have a really high level of trust in scientists, particularly those who are independently working at universities, because of that reason, they're not held accountable to anyone with a vested interest and it keeps that really clear. I think if you look at the data from things like the Eurobarometer about the, what the public think is where the money should be spent, um, obviously health and medical care always scores right at the top and food is pretty high as well. So you guys are in quite a good area for public support. As a physicist, I think it's often a lot harder for particle physicists and people from physics to try and make that connection that you've all got quite clearly. Does anyone have questions they'd like to raise? We've got a few more minutes. Yeah, at the front. Is there a microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is... Uh, Okay, my question is related to what we talked previously about the impact at the end. I mean, um, we have to demonstrate this clearly the, the public will have interest in, in knowing the results of your studies. But then, when we mention about the impact, how your results will be affected now in the, our daily lives of most of the European citizens, where, as you pointed out, might be a very strong uh, food industry, might not be happy with your results, uh, might not be likely to have a share e-food um, and, and so on. So how those results can be translated to, to, to real impact and how are the other counter forces might fight you? Who would like to take that? Well, I, I can answer that uh, the real impact is the translation in regarding my, my own research is the translation into clinical practice. For example, in the Mayo Clinic in the US, they are using our points of adherence to the Mediterranean diet in order to assess whether or not their patients are adhering to a healthy dietary pattern. So I think that the translation of the research into the clinical field, into a family doctor or a GP is doing every day, is the, the test of our hmm, applicability or, or translation. I don't know if I am answering your question, but. The impact is how, how this is changing. For example, uh, as uh, more and more research has been done in a, on a healthy diet, for example, in the US now, the rates of type 2 diabetes are going down for the first time. They went up and up until a lot of epidemiologic studies address the issue of glycemic index, refined cereals, red and processed meats, and the relationship with diabetes. This went to the public. The public reduced the consumption of sugar, sugar beverages, and so on. And then the rates of diabetes at least are stabilizing, are uh, stopped. They are not growing. So this is a big impact because in most Western countries, the rate of diabetes is 10% of the population. So we need to stop that epidemic. Hmm? and the, the way is doing a good research. So this is the impact. Thank you, Maria Makar of Finland. Dr. Gonzalez, are you perhaps thinking of uh, trying to link uh, olive oil and nuts to the gut microbiome, which has such a yes, huge yes. impact on our health? Yes, yes. Uh, we, we are working on that. We are working on that. We are collecting in some centers of the PREDIMED Plus, 
study because there are two trials. The PREDIMED one was completed 2013, and now the ongoing uh, trial is PREDIMED plus. And in some centers, we are collecting samples in order to assess the microbiota. So this is really very, very important. Um, my name is Malin Eklund from the Swedish Research Council. Uh, it's a question uh, around the non-communicable diseases again. What do you think would be the difference if you were, now you were funded through the ERC, but your field is very relevant for the Societal Challenge 1, for example, and there you would have had the requirement of adding other European countries in your consortium, perhaps a SME or something. Do you think there would be that difference to your project? Yes, yes. I think uh, the, the funding by the ERC is excellent for this project because uh, a requirement for doing a good trial is to have a lot of homogeneity in the participants. Hmm? If the requirement for getting funding is to include 10 countries, it is very difficult to get a homogenization hmm? homogeneous <coughs> diet in very different countries. Hmm? So if you want to do a trial, you need to have two or three groups, but completely homogeneous with no difference between the participants with the same diet. This is impossible in a multi, uh, in, in, a, in an international project. So for, for me, the ERC was a, a, an excellent opportunity to conduct such a large trial. Hmm? And also because we were thinking in applying to other EU grant, not the ERC, but uh, our problem was that we have created in Spain a, a group that is working together for the last 13 years, hmm? a group of investigators. We know the methods, we are in, in a very good collaboration. So if we need to add now new partners hmm, from many countries, this will not work so well. Hmm? This is my, my feeling. Presumably, that might be a next step to see how well it equates oh, and differs. Of course, of course. Now, the relevant question is the transferability. Yeah. But did, did, did need a very different type of trial data. from yeah. the scientific point of view. You yeah. have to design a specific trial for addressing for that question, transferability yeah. of the Mediterranean diet to non-Mediterranean countries, yeah. but not to test the Mediterranean diet in the Mediterranean in that, countries. Yeah. Do you want to respond to the impact question from two quite different perspectives and how you yeah. think your work will translate into that societal impact? Yeah, it's actually an interesting point. And I think, for instance, the work that we are doing in worms, I mean, it's a long way from applying this to, to the human situation. So I think it's a fair point. But I think that's what makes ERC scheme uh, such a powerful research scheme. Because, I mean, you can do this blue sky research without knowing the exact impact. Of course, all the funding bodies, the, whether ERC or national funding bodies, they ask you to think about the potential impact and how this knowledge will be utilized in the end by the general audience. And, and I think with this type of research, it's always quite easy to justify that there is a long-term uh, uh, benefit. But for instance, the work that we are doing in these worms, obviously that's a lot, a lot further along the line than for instance, uh, the work that others here are doing that is uh, much more immediate impact. Um, so I think the impact is, is definitely important and I think everyone should think about the impact, but it should not be, um, I mean, there should be room for this blue sky research that um, doesn't have an immediate impact. I think, I mean, just this week, um, the, our, our Dutch Nobel Prize winner was all over the news. He won the Nobel Prize for chemistry for developing nanomotors. Uh, and he kept emphasizing that if he, if he didn't have the funding at the early stage to do this research, uh, he would never have gotten the Nobel Prize, and, and he emphasizes that there should be really a large portion or a, a significant portion, at least, of the budget to this kind of research. Anna, do you want yeah, to no, just quickly, I mean, I would agree with that. I mean, we, in my particular case, uh, the landscape of these kinds of activities was unknown. So we didn't know that there was something to study. Um, but we need to understand that landscape before we can start examining the impacts it potentially might have in terms of creating more sustainable urban food systems and to gather that data in a comparable way internationally to map that landscape provides us with that information which can then go on to have that impact potentially through planning policies, through health and safety regulations, through supportive processes for innovation in urban growing, for example, and resilient cities. So yeah, absolutely, starting from that notion of, we, sometimes we don't know 
what the solutions will be when we start. And we have to explore lots of different avenues until we get there. And we need to understand that. And that is a step in that process. Great. I think we'll have to leave it there. So can we all just thank the three speakers for the presentation? Thank you. Thank you very much to, to all of you and to Wendy as well. Um, I, should, I should just say a word of explanation. Um, the coordinator for Science Squared is Science Business uh, in that project. The reason is because, editorially speaking, we at Science Business believe very strongly in the importance of frontier research. And um, it isn't because we have universities who are members, it's because we have companies who are members. And I do not know a single major company R&D director who does not believe that the public sector should be supporting frontier research because for the most part, the companies won't do it. So somebody has to do it to provide the future. Anyway, thank you very much to the panelists. And um, I should say, uh, we go now to the workshops. Uh, I can't, uh, you, there, uh, is it up on the, uh, put the, uh, yeah, uh, the rooms, yes, you can see them there. So just running through it, the health workshop is right here in the Horta room, that's the plenary room. Is that, have I got that right? Yes, okay. Uh, the uh, uh, energy and resources is in the NSOR room, which is downstairs. The security and defense workshop is in the Grand Salon upstairs. Uh, and the cars, connected cars workshop is in the Falone room, also upstairs. So we scatter a bit, and then we'll come back to lunch. And I don't know if olive oil is on the menu, but I sure hope so. Yeah.